I recognize Senator Persky. Will the committee appointed to wait on the governor please escort him to the podium? Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and the General Assembly, distinguished guests and my cabinet, my family, and ladies and gentlemen, I, while I was waiting, I figured that, that my term actually runs eight years and four days as governor, and, and I grew to understand why I needed the extra four days. Uh, and you've had a long afternoon, and I uh, congratulate to all of you. And I will try to be reasonably brief in my remarks uh, to you, because you've had uh, a long afternoon, and because I'm well aware that uh, uh, I've been described as the oratorical equivalent of a block pun. <laughs> John's going to say. Some, someone with a sense of humor decided that the departing governor should deliver his final uh, message to the incoming legislature. The theory, I'm sure, was that one of us might learn something from the encounter. <laughs> A theory which, to borrow Samuel Johnson's phrase, usually proves to be just another triumph of hope over experience. But theory aside, this constitutional ritual today does signify something important, the continuity of government and the need, if not to learn from one another, then at least to understand that we have an obligation to build upon the accomplishments of past administrations and to finish what they have left undone. I have made it my task in the last eight years to build upon the considerable progress made by my predecessors, Alfred E. Driscoll, Robert B. Minor, Richard J. Hughes, and William T. Cahill. Their struggles with an inequitable and inadequate tax system helped create the climate that allowed this administration to enact, finally, a modern, broad-based, if not progressive, tax structure, introduce a system of educational accountability into our schools, cap the runaway growth of local spending, and ease the pressure of the property tax. The Meadowlands uh, complex, conceived in the Cahill years, was made a reality by this administration over the opposition of business, government, and banking interests in New York, in providing for the elderly, 
in protecting the consumer, in tending to the mentally and physically disabled. We have maintained the unbroken 30-year tradition of progressive government embraced by Republican as well as Democratic chief executives. We can take pride in that tradition, bipartisan pride. But new challenges faced our state in the last eight years, challenges for which the past provided neither precedent nor a popular consensus on how to deal with them. This administration has tried to meet them with energy and imagination, and not merely money. A rising crime rate produced cries for capital punishment and longer jail terms. But few exhibited the, any patience with the causes of crime. And none, it seems, wanted new prisons built within commuting distance of home. We responded with a new criminal code that produced more convictions, longer sentences, tougher parole criteria, and then a $30 million bond issue to build needed new jails. The growth of the state and the spread of suburban development threatened to engulf even the Pinelands, a precious natural resource of water and woodland. Over the objection of real estate interests masquerading as home rule, we responded with the help of a courageous and far-sighted legislature by enacting laws that will preserve this natural treasure for the present and future generations. Atlantic City was dying. All the traditional avenues of urban reinvestment seemed closed to its people. We responded with a casino law uh, designed as a catalyst to restore jobs, housing opportunity, and above all, hope to a city that was once America's playground and can be again. We were an administration that experimented, but never with our commitment to integrity. We have sought to reduce the role of private capital and individual influence in the political process by publicly financing the election of our state's highest officer. We have enact enacted the toughest kind of full disclosure regulations and have created the Department of Public Advocate to test our judgment against the public interest. And we have conducted the public's business in the sunshine. We've invited the gaming industry into our state, but on our terms, not on theirs. We have heeded the admonition of Thomas Jefferson that the whole of government consists in the art of being honest. We have lived by my promise of eight years ago that New Jersey is not for sale. This is our record and our legacy to the people of New Jersey. We submit it with pride. Thank you. Our accomplishments often represented a significant departure from the policies of the past. Frequently, we challenged the status quo, and sometimes we threatened vested interests. My administration was often one of controversy, tumult, and conflict, for that is the price of change. I earnestly hope that your sessions will be less Hectic. By comparison, 
the reign of Cain may seem a little tame. <laughs> these, these are difficult times and hard challenges lie ahead. As I prepare to turn this office over to Governor Kane, I am aware that much remains to be done in spite of our best efforts and the efforts of those who have governed before us. I do not leave you a perfect society or a perfect government. Both will be tested in the days ahead. For the pace of change is quickening and the needs of a dynamic society will require governmental attention and response. In my printed message, which I left on your desk, I have outlined a series of problems and proposals. I would like to speak now on just a few. The problems of pollution and hazardous waste are critical. My administration sounded the alarm and created the governmental responses that will let you organize solutions. But my pride in this accomplishment is coupled with caution, for New Jersey has become the laboratory in which industrial America will determine how, even whether, it will maintain the purity of its environment amid the growth and spread of industry and people. You will face pressures to ease regulations and cries that neither the public nor industry can afford cleanup costs. But you must ask yourself this question. If in the end we cannot guarantee our people pure water, air that is fresh and clean, and soil free of the toxic residue of industry, then who will want to live here? In this connection, I ask you to commit yourself again to the preservation of the Pinelands. I have called the Pinelands preservation my most important accomplishment. But the struggle to save it is not over. It is a battle which must be won every day, and if once lost, is lost forever. I am encouraged by Governor-elect Kane's commitment to the preservation of the Pinelands, and I ask that you support him in that commitment. We, we will be judged as a place to live in large measure, both by industry and individuals, on the quality of our educational system. The thorough and efficient law, and indeed its constitutional mandate, has begun to make its improvements felt. But the demands on it in the years ahead will grow, not diminish. And while the minimum basic skills test scores show that the T and E law is beginning to produce benefits in the lower grades. Our high school test scores, like those in most states, are disappointing. Accordingly, we must ask ourselves whether our high school diplomas have any value in the marketplace of the future or even the present. If not, then surely we must take additional steps to see that they do. And my goal has always been to give a high school graduate a diploma he can read. <laughs> or she can read. We cannot escape our role as a corridor state. Our people and our products must be able to move easily and economically 
through the great cities of New York and Philadelphia as well as within the state itself. But we can no longer take this vital transportation system for granted. Federal aid, which has held our commuter service intact in recent years, is being reduced and even withdrawn in some cases. Unless new funding is found, the state's rail system will face confiscatory fare hikes or eventual collapse, or both. You will hear some say, so be it. Let rail service pay its own way or perish. But, we war but be warned that unless some way is found to move our people and our products economically in the decade of the 80s, New Jersey faces the prospect of real economic decline and a mobility crisis. As the decade of the 80s opened, we were already aware that our state's greatest resource, its population, was both uh, slowing in growth and growing older. The implications of that change are great. An expanding uh, pensioner population supported, at least in part, by a relatively smaller force of young workers. Conflicting economic interests must be reconciled. We must ensure that our public pension costs do not become an intolerable burden on our younger workers, and that our pension add-ons are properly funded. Unfunded pension obligations in the current year's budget are over a million dollars, a billion, a uh, hundred million dollars, and are increasing at the rate of about 20 percent a year. At that same time, our population is shifting. South Jersey and the communities along the seashore and in the northwest are growing. They will exert more influence on the life of our state. But they will begin also to face the problems of some of our older, more settled sections, with an important difference, however. They will still have time, in most cases, to adopt rational policies of zoning and investment that will ease their way into the late 1980s. State government should encourage that process and not impede it in the name of home rule. No problem so resists solution as does the revitalization of our cities. And no discussion of that problem makes sense without mention of the, ma of the matter of money and taxes. The tax structure of this state is better today than it was eight years ago, but worse than it should be. We have an income tax, but not one that is progressive. Our tax system, even with reform, has not relieved the cities of the unfair weight of welfare costs and other services, many of which exist in part to serve the nearby suburbs with jobs, hospitals, or police and fire protection. Even a modest regional or statewide component of the property tax would help redistribute some funds to our overburdened cities. I must repeat my frustration that our income tax is not progressive. This legislature, consistent with any commitment not to raise taxes, could make the existing state income tax more equitable so that those who benefit most from our state would shoulder the greater burden. The recent changes in the federal tax code have increased the inequities plaguing our tax system. A graduated tax could exempt hard-pressed wage earners and still raise the same number of dollars for our treasury. Some of our urban areas could be helped in special ways. For example, our side of the Hudson River suffers by comparison with the New York side. Liberty State Park in Jersey City is an exception. For the most part, our Hudson 
River waterfront bears the scar tissue of uncoordinated development or no development at all. Several years ago, I appointed a commission, including the mayors of the communities involved, uh, to plan for the waterfront future. They have since recommended legislation which recognizes the regional interest in developing that waterfront's great potential. We should encourage that regional management of the Hudson Waterfront. In designing Liberty Park, this administration has made a significant beginning, one that can spark a period of renewal in Jersey City, much as the Baltimore Harbor development has revived that city. And so, too, the development of the rest of the Hudson River waterfront can prove a boon to the communities up and down that section of the riverfront. This morning, I signed legislation that promises to give you still another weapon in the struggle to revive our cities, an $85 million bond proposal sponsored by Senator Merlino. If, uh, I'll always wait while you applaud Joe Merlino. <laughs> if approved by the voters in November, this measure will allow New Jersey to provide funds to local government and private industry for such projects as the redevelopment of Newark Symphony Hall, construction of a Trenton Civic Center, development of a science and technology museum, and of course the refurbishing of the Hudson Waterfront. The problems in this state must be addressed and solved in the context of national priorities. We live today with a national administration whose priorities lie too much in the Pentagon. It has It has pledged to return social responsibilities to the states, but without adequate revenues to meet those responsibilities. As governor, I have spoken out to both parties in protest against these skewed priorities. I believe the commitment of $200 billion in defense expenditures at a time of scarcity and sacrifice is irrational and counterproductive. It will buy us no real safety in a nuclear age. The state of New Jersey and its seven and a half million people are defenseless today against a nuclear attack if it should come. This state has no civil defense strategy to protect against a nuclear attack. My work is done and yours has just begun. My work was undertaken in an era of one-party control of the legislative and executive branches of state government. I am aware that of the debt I owe to the Democratic legislatures of the 70s, to the men uh, who led them, especially Senate President Joe Merlino and Speaker Chris Jackman, to the leaders of the legislature and both parties over the past eight years to my cabinet, my friends, my staff, Harold Hodes, and the other uh, leaders in the state who have helped throughout the eight years. Your work will begin in a different climate with an administration and a legislature of different parties. In such a climate, there are those who will preach obstruction or call for a clash of ideologies in the hope of presiding over stalemate. Please don't listen 
to that advice. You will hear it said that government itself is the problem. But 50 years ago, uh, Franklin Roosevelt saved our system because he understood that a modern society requires the proper intervention of government when the free market system needs help. And in the years since then, government has been the instrument by which the great constitutional guarantee of equality for all, so long delayed in fulfillment, has finally been achieved. We cannot go back to the good old days, no matter what you hear from Washington. And giving tax breaks to colleges which practice discrimination isn't the good old days either. The problems that beset us will not disappear if we dismantle government. Indeed, to the degree that we deny government its proper role, we reduce our chances of ever managing our problems and elevating the lives of our people. This is not exclusively liberal creed or conservative dogma. John Kennedy warned that if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. But Edmund Burke, the greatest conservative of his day, said it even more strongly with these words, government is a contrivance of human wisdom to provide for human wants. Men have a right that these wants should be provided for by this wisdom. It will be your duty and the duty of the new administration to contrive ways to meet those human wants, to help the many who are poor in our state, if only to make sure that you save the few who are rich. Almost nine years ago, I came to this office with the promise of a new beginning for New Jersey. It was a time of approaching economic distress. Even more discouraging was the moral crisis that had engulfed our state and national governments. We have made that new beginning. We have moved New Jersey in new directions. We have altered its image in a way and the way in which state government is conducted. In a week, that new beginning will give way to another administration led by Governor Kane, as pledged to new directions as we were. And again, our state and nation face severe economic and social problems. History will have to decide whether the people of New Jersey were adequately armored to meet the challenges of the 80s by the struggles and achievements of the 70s, whatever history's verdict. My family and I shall always be grateful to the people of New Jersey for the honor and opportunity you've given me. Governor Brendan Byrne concluding his eighth and final State of the State Address here in the Assembly Chambers in Trenton, New Jersey. The Governor said he and his family were honored to have served this state, and earlier in his speech he listed his accomplishments. Among those accomplishments, a new criminal code, more convictions at Governor Byrne, tougher parole conditions, and a $30 million bond act for new prisons to fight crime in New Jersey. 
Governor Byrd said suburban sprawl threatened the pine lands, but it was his administration and the 199th legislature that enacted the legislation to protect the pine lands. The governor said Atlantic City was dying, but his administration responded with casino gambling. He said casino gambling gave hope to Atlantic City, but in the process of giving hope to that city, they didn't loosen up controls on casino gambling. They said the casinos came to New Jersey on their terms, on his terms rather, not the casino terms, said Governor Byrne, New Jersey is not for sale. The governor also reacted with pride by saying that the state of New Jersey enacted sunshine laws to let everybody see what was going on in the halls of government. That, said Governor Byrne, is our legacy to the people of New Jersey, and he submitted it with pride. But he also said there were some problems ahead for the incoming administration of Tom Kane. He said, Byrne said, his administration was often the source of controversy. To quote Governor Byrne, he, he says, by comparison, the reign of Kane may seem a little tame. Governor Byrne said the pace of change is quickening and it is going to require quick governmental response. He said there are problems, very serious problems in New Jersey of pollution and hazardous waste. He called those problems critical and he said if we cannot guarantee clean air, soil and water, who will want to live in New Jersey? And he called again for the preservation of the Pine Lands. Presently right now the convocation is being given on the State of the State Address. This has been a special presentation of the New Jersey Network. I'm Larry Stupnagel. Good afternoon. Shower your benediction and grace and abundance upon all who are present. May your peace and blessing, Almighty God, abide always in this place.